Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Dan Lasserson. Um, as Cora said, um, uh, my day job is research, and by night I'm a GP. So if you ring out of hours care, it's someone like me, people that you see if you get and feel unwell in the evenings or at weekends. But it's a daytime free to research and to research important things like chronic kidney disease. Um, and the title here is Why is it more important? It's more important than ever, and hopefully I'm going to <coughs> show you why. Um, first of all, I think we should probably answer the question, what does the kidney do? Now, I've, uh, I'm no great artist, I'm no Chagall, but I can draw functionally, so hopefully that will help us work out quite what the kidney does. If we take a simple overview, we know that blood goes into the kidney, we know that blood leaves the kidney, and in between, urine gets produced. And I've used some helpful colour-coded arrows there, so you can see which is which on the chart. But that process of filtration to get that urine out is quite beautiful, actually, and it's a very, very clever mechanism. If we take a tiny bit of the kidney and we make it a bit bigger here, I'm gonna, I'll, probably, I'll need to walk around in this talk, partly because it keeps us all animated and partly because I can get around these things. So here we have a little tiny bit of kidney that I've made a little bit bigger. And this tells us what's happening with this filtration process. Blood goes into the kidney, so rather goes into this tiny little structure here called the glomerulus. And there's millions of these things in the kidney, these glomeruli. Blood comes in, and then when it blood travels through this little complex mesh of vessels, fluid gets squeezed out. And it gets squeezed out through tiny holes, and uh, it forms this fluid, which is a filtrate. It's produced by filtration. And that's going to be a key thing for us as we talk about kidney function and how we try and assess risk, particularly in primary care with blood tests. And then we know that blood then leaves the discomerus afterwards. So the filtration structure is basically this tiny thing called the glomerulus. There's millions of them all doing it all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The kidneys never close. This is happening all the time. Now, this filtration comes down here. This fluid comes down these little tiny tubes there. And we want the kidney to get rid of waste products. But the blood has all those good things that we need as well, like fluid, sugar, the building blocks of proteins, amino acids. And we don't want to lose those things in our urine. We want to bring them back again. So a process of reabsorption occurs too. All the things that we need for ourselves to keep alive that we've lost in that initial squeezing fluid out, we then drag back in again. Okay. So all that's left is the stuff that we just don't want. But anything that came out of that initial filtration, we now grab back in again. So the kidneys do it. That's quite a clever thing to do. Gets rid of everything in the blood and then brings back in the things that we need and leaves the waste behind. So by doing that, it helps us regulate three important things. The amount of water in our bodies. If there's too little water, the kidney will bring more water back into the blood. If there's too much water around, the kidney will make sure water is lost, will produce more urine. It keeps our key salts in balance. There's two that are really important for us, sodium and potassium. And the kidney is very good at keeping them at nice, stable levels. And that's important for all the cells in our body. When our cells create energy for the living processes of, of, of keeping all our organs going and giving us a hopefully healthy and happy life, it creates acid. And the kidney is very good at getting rid of that acid. That's it's one of its key jobs too. Okay. Now, the kidney does other things too, if that wasn't enough. It produces hormones. And those hormones are important for a number of the body processes. Regulating blood pressure, one of the most important things that a kidney hormone does. And a lot of the medications that if you do have raised blood pressure, your doctor may prescribe, will act on that hormone system from the kidney. The kidney is also good at keeping our calcium levels straight, and that's important for our bone health. Kidneys have an important role in keeping our bones healthy with vitamin D. It activates vitamin D. The kidney also produces a hormone that makes red cells be produced. Red cells are important, they carry oxygen. And uh, if you have a blood test and you're found to be anemic, it's because you have fewer red blood cells than normal. And the red blood cell is obviously key in getting oxygen around the body to, get to keep the cells alive. The kidney also does its own housekeeping. It's a very neat and tidy organ. And it produces hormones that, again, help blood flow move around inside the kidney so the kidney can work as well as possible. So the kidney does all these complex things. It helps keep a normal environment for the body's cells to keep working. And 
It also does a number of other things to make sure blood pressure is okay and that our bones are healthy and we have enough red cells to transport oxygen around. So, I'm going to give a number of summary slides after these little bite-sized things I'm going to say so we can just focus on the messages. So, the kidney's key tasks to regulate water, our sodium and potassium, keeping our acid okay after we've created acid by our cells producing energy and to make sure the, the calcium levels are okay, blood pressure, we're not anemic and it gets rid of those medications too that your doctor may prescribe. Now, how do we measure kidney function? How do you measure kidney function? Again, back to our helpful colour-coded diagram. And although I've just said a number of things a kidney does, it does an awful lot of things, but we tend to focus on one thing when we measure kidney function in medicine, and that's how much of that filtration is being produced. So we tend not to worry about little alterations and the other things, it's just we're focusing on how much filtration is produced. Certainly in primary care, that's our key aim. So if you wanted to measure my kidney function, what would you need to do? Well, one thing that you could do is you could inject me with something that you know the kidney gets rid of. And in order to follow that thing around the body, you could make it either light up on a scan by um, adding certain chemicals to it or making it radioactive with a little dose of radiation. Not enough to harm you, just a little dose so that people can chase it and find out where it is and then measure that in the blood and the urine. Now, that's a very accurate way of measuring how our kidneys function, but it's invasive. I'm injecting you with something that you don't normally have, and that's not a good idea. It's inconvenient because you need to hang around for a number of hours and wait for these things to be done, and it costs money. So there, but luckily there's an alternative. You could measure something that your body makes already, and we use something that our muscles make. Okay, and as to this very muscly action man there is telling us to remind me about that. So we measured this chemical that's produced in the body that the kidney gets rid of. So it saves us finding something to inject. And that's quite helpful because um, it's cheap, it's convenient. You just have one blood test and then you can go off back to whatever you were doing. It's not invasive. I haven't had to inject you with anything. But it's not as accurate. And that muscle man there reminds you why it's not accurate. Because if you have bigger muscles, the blood level of your creatinine, this chemical, will be a bit higher. Not because your kidneys aren't working, just because you're more muscly. So we'll bear, we need to bear that in mind as we work out how we can assess kidney function, how we can predict risk. Now, what happens to our kidneys as we get older? My daughter, Amelie, drew this last week whilst she was waiting for me to make her breakfast. And I thought she was giving me a subtle hint that I was taking a bit longer over her porridge than normal. In fact, not so. She was drawing out the life cycle for me. Um, and are any artists among you will realise she's left-handed because all of her figures have a slight left-leaning spinal curvature. She sits there. But that, Emily's diagram reminds us about several things. Change is a natural process with age. Okay. And the natural process may result in reduced function. That's not necessarily a disease, it's nature. So there's less function as we get older, but that's, that, that's part of a natural process. And we need to bear that in mind when we're thinking about our kidneys as they reduce in function as they get older, what is a disease and what is part of a natural process. Now, um, the best data that we have about kidney function as we get older comes from kidney donors. And in America, they have quite old kidney donors. And this American study measured kidney function they, by injecting chemicals and measuring what happened. And they looked at, they had kidney donors who were from 20 up to age of 65. This is in Cleveland in the Mayo Clinic. And these are, these are people with the best kidneys around because they're donating them for someone who needs them. And this, and this, if we just think about this black line, this just tells us where the average kidney function is. Now, I don't need to worry so much about the numbers, but what it shows is that as we get older, there is a gradual decline until about 45, and then that decline tends to get a bit steeper. So our kidneys are reducing their function a little bit as we get older, and that's part of a natural process. Okay, that's part of a natural process. But that reduction in function gets a bit quicker as we go into the second and third phases of our lives. So, kidney function. 
We focus on filtration. It's about all these wonderful things I told you what the kidney does. When it comes down to it, us doctors take a very, very simplistic view. How much of that filtration fluid is produced? We can either measure it by adding a chemical, or we can basically estimate it from a substance your body produces already. It's less accurate, but that's cheaper and convenient for all concerned. And the kidney changes as we get older and filters less. So what is chronic kidney disease? Well, it's pretty easier for us to think about this by looking at the risks of um, the risks of having a slight reduction in our kidney function. Now this pretty picture was um, taken from data in America from the Department of Veterans Affairs. These are people who've been in the army and are in the Veterans Affairs an integrated healthcare provider system in America. And there are four and a half million people went into making this diagram. And what it does is it shows us the risks of death, one of the most important outcomes we need to prevent in medicine. And it shows those risks by our age and also by how well our kidneys are doing. And I'll walk you through this. Now, as we can see naturally, and as Amelie's diagram reminds us, the lifetime risk of death is one. It's 100%. And perhaps our job is to make that as far away the distance as possible and for us to be as happy and healthy along that journey. So unsurprisingly, we see that as we get older, whatever our kidney function, the risk of death does increase. And that's natural. But if you look within these age groups, this is good kidney function, and this is kidney function gradually getting worse and worse and worse which shows that those risks of death get higher in these age groups. Kidney, how well our kidneys are doing is telling us something about our risk of disease. And most of this is actually cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes and heart failure, important things for us to prevent. And although perhaps this diagram doesn't show it that well, um, because the starting blocks are a bit higher when we're of much older age, the risks of the kidney aren't quite so great when the kidney is only mildly reduced in function. When we're younger, it's a bit more important if our kidneys are mildly reduced in function. It's more important for us in terms of our risks of disease. Now that's measuring kidney function from the blood test. There's something else we can do with kidneys, and that's measure how much protein's in our urine. That's quite straightforward and simple. Take a bit of our wee in a pot and send it off to the lab. And the lab measures how much protein there is. Normally, there shouldn't be much protein, if any at all, in our urine. And this is taking an older age group from America. And just, uh, these were people that were enrolled in a study looking at stroke and risk of stroke in the stroke belt, which is the southeastern bit of America, Minnesota, um, in um, North and South Carolina, and Arkansas, and Mississippi. And what this tells us is that it doesn't matter what we measure in terms of our kidney function, how much protein's in our urine? Because that's a risk. And again, we see what we saw in the last time. As we get older, unsurprisingly, the mortality is higher. But that's because we're approaching the end of a natural life, and that's natural. But whatever our age group, if there's more and more protein in our urine, we're at greater risk. So two important things for us to think about when we're diagnosing ki chronic kidney disease. It's what's our kidney function? And is there protein in our urine? These are two things we need to know so we can help work out who is at risk and intervene to reduce that risk. Important function of primary care and prevention at population level. So NICE has got this way in which we diagnose kidney disease. And it basically says, well, if it's below 60, when we try and work out what you're filtering, and those, that's basically a number that tells us how much filtration is, how much filtrate is being produced. And when you have ever seen printouts of your blood results from your doctor, there'll be a number like that. And so that's kidney disease. But also, because there's protein in the urine is at risk, NICE has always said, well, whatever your kidney function is from the blood test, if there's evidence of kidney damage from protein being there, then you've also got chronic kidney disease. So it helps doctors give us a framework for diagnosing chronic kidney disease in patients. We need to look at what's in the urine. We need to look at the blood test to work out how much filtration is being produced by the kidney. So chronic kidney disease, it's a state of reduced filtration, but you only need to be reduced by a relatively small amount. There could be protein in the urine, and the importance of that is this increases mortality. 
although that may have less influence as we get older. It may be more important to diagnose chronic kidney disease at, at younger age because it increased risks there. Are we diagnosing it accurately in primary care at the moment? That's an important point. Are we diagnosing it accurately? It's an important condition. We need to be able to diagnose it properly in primary care. Well, as I said, you either measure it with this complicated, invasive, fancy test, or we take a blood test from you and we try and work out what it is from that blood test. And that involves an estimation, an intellectual best guess. And that best guess is, is an equation that the, the biochemistry laboratory works out for us. So we give the blood to the biochemistry lab and it comes back with a number of what it estimates your kidney function is. And I want to illustrate a general problem we have in medicine about estimation. Increasingly, we need to use risk prediction, predictive tools. These are estimations, but they have a problem. And the problem is that they have what's called a home turf advantage. In other words, let's think about the situation in which that particular way of estimating things was derived. Who were the patients that we used? And for the current equation that we're using, that's generating all of our um, kidney filtration estimations from our own blood results, was from a relatively young population who attended renal clinics, predominantly in America. And I want to estimate kidney function in the general population, and the most people I see are generally a bit older, and I don't know what their kidney function's like. That's not a home turf. If you think about that, that stadium there is the Emirates Stadium where Arsenal play. And this stadium is the Spartak Moscow ground in Russia. Now, Arsenal have always lost when they've played Spartak Moscow in Russia. Similarly, Spartak Moscow have always won when they've played Arsenal in Russia. But it's not the case when they play them in, 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 at home in Arsenal. So in other words, Arsenal show a home turn of turf advantage. They always win when they play on their home turf, and they always seem to lose when they play on away turf. And it's exactly the same in reverse for Spartak Moscow. So estimation in medicine, you, it always does better on its home turf. And we as doctors need to think, what was the home turf for this estimation? The, the patient who's in front of me who I want to estimate something for, would they have been in this original study? Is this an away turf or a home turf for this particular way of estimating something? And that's important for us to think about in the, if we're doing things accurately so we get it right for you, because that's why we're here. So we need to estimate renal function in the general population, people in primary care. But a prediction method that only works well on home turf is not going to help us. Irritatingly for us, the current way in which we're doing it, the accuracy gets worse around the threshold at which we're trying to make a CKD diagnosis. And that's a problem. Help is at hand, though. A new and more accurate method is available. Well, that's good news. And just to prove that, this is from um, 16 different studies where people have measured the filtration by adding chemicals and then also estimated it by taking blood for looking at these levels of creatinine. This line here is the line of perfect accuracy. The greyish lines here are the current method that's used up and down the country, across Europe and the world. And this thick black line is what I hope NICE and other organisations will recommend that we use, after data that many, many have produced, which shows that although it's not quite as accurate and there's no, nothing perfect, it's a lot better than this one that's very inaccurate. So this new equation is a much more accurate way of working out what our kidney function is. And all it needs to do is for the labs just to, just to change their equation. It's a matter of moments to alter the software in the lab. Nothing fancy needs doing, no extra tests. So, but it would be very important to do. We think it would be. So, <coughs> estimating our kidney function, we rely on a prediction. Predictions show a home turf advantage. In other words, they do better in the setting where they were first derived. But there, are, there is a better method available than the one that we use at the moment. So every day, Estimations are being done that are inaccurate, and they shouldn't be. So, changing this magical equation for our kidney function, does it matter? Well, I did some work looking at what would happen if we used this more accurate method in Oxfordshire. So, what this um, shows is what we call a distribution of kidney function, and it's basically how many people have what sort of kidney function. 
and this is based on 180,000 blood results, anonymised, um, that were in the uh, biochemistry lab at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And this shows something we often see in nature, the normal distribution. And what this means is that most people are roughly in the middle, and a few people are at either end, either with very good function or with a bit poorer function. And most people are around about the middle. And this current equation is being used. We thought, well, what would happen if we just changed the equation to a better estimating one, the one that I just presented to you? What would happen in Oxfordshire? What would happen is that everyone's kidney function would gradually move here to being a bit better. Now, I'm not saying for just for one second that we've cured the problem by simply just having a different equation because we're the same people with the same kidneys and the same filtration, but we can more accurately say who is at risk. And also importantly for us, because we'll talk about this shortly, but those of you who go and see your GPs for reviews for chronic kidney disease, for example, um, have a diagnosis based on this magical number of 60. The vast majority of people have their CKD diagnosis based on this estimation because their kidneys look okay and there's no patient in their urine. Most people in primary care have their CKD diagnosis from this estimate. And what this shows is that this new equation, there are fewer people here than if you look at the dotted line one. So overall we will reduce the number of people who have this diagnosis of CKD because it's a bit more accurate. We were overcalling the shots beforehand with a less accurate equation. However, it's not the case that everyone across the board would have a slightly better renal function if we estimated it that way. What this shows is that actually the reason why there's this change in the number of people with the diagnosis is because we were underestimating the function in younger people, particularly women. So blood tests and estimates on kidney function were basically estimating younger women as having poorer kidney function than they actually do. Conversely, is that the old way of, of, think, of trying to estimate kidney function found that older men were, had, lower, had probably better kidney function than we thought they did. So what changing this will do well, that's a simple thing in the lab, just to give the GPs different numbers. Quite a few people will find that they've had diagnoses added or taken away. Because we're now doing things, we could do things much, much more accurately. And that will affect, um, a dip by adding diagnoses to people who are elderly, and taking away diagnoses from people who are younger. So, it does matter that we change it. Maybe small, but that's because in general practice, we uh, try and accurately capture people who are at risk. But we have to do that within certain rules and limits because there's so many people on our books. And these estimations are not accurate and change them may help. Is this new equation better at helping us predict risk? It may be more accurate in telling us who has CKD. Is it more accurate in telling us who predicts risk? The answer is yes. This data again comes from America and this looks at kidney function and looks at the risk of coronary heart disease over, over a follow-up period of some years. And this blue line here is the risk of your heart disease depending on what your kidney function was a number of years previously. And for people with good kidney function, it's low. And if your kidney function is not so good, it's higher. And that fits. Whereas the red line, it's a bit mishy-moshy here. And it's all a bit flat. So it's not as good at helping us predict risk. So this new equation, which would cost nothing to implement, is more accurate and helps us predict risk. So, little inter summary slide. We may change to a new way of estimating kidney function. This will overall reduce the numbers with this CKD diagnosis, but more older people will have a new diagnosis of a CKD. And the new equation is more accurate and may help us predict cardiovascular events. So, if you remember that big muscle man, he was producing lots of creatinine, and that was how we were measuring kidney function. Is it the best test, though? It's one that we've always used. I qualified in 1999, and it's been around for years then, and I've been using it ever since. Is it the best test for kidney function? 
The reason I'm showing you this graph is because there's something that's not quite right about creatinine. It's not quite right. This is data from a million people. A million people into making this slide. And it looked at their kidney function and looked at risk of death with kidney function. And this is very, very good kidneys. And this here, the kidneys are not so good down here. And uh, this bit of the graph shows what we would expect by now, that as your kidneys deteriorate in their function, the risk of death is higher. But this then troubles me. Because here, your kidney's good, function's good, but the risk of death's increasing. And that's not right. That's not right at all. And it's partly because we're basing our estimates on creatinine, and it's not the best test of kidney function. And so we may think people here have no risk at all, when in fact their risk is a bit higher, because creatinine is misleading us. The test we use every day, and it misleads us, and that's important. But luckily, help is at hand. Help is always at hand. I'll describe what this means in a second. But this was data from something called the cardiovascular health study. It took patients who were 65 and over and followed them up for a number of years. And the question that they had was, what happens next? Probably the most important question we have in medicine. Often I find people come to see me, they want to know what's going to happen next. Will I get better if I do this or if I do that? What does this symptom mean? A lot of the questions in the consultation about what's going to happen next. Now, these people took blood from all these people aged 65 and over in different bits of America and just waited to see what happened next. And here we're again, we're looking at mortality and we're seeing a similar thing to what we found in that previous graph. So, these, so, number, so this is people with the best kidney function and this is people with the worst kidney function. And we found that, that if you measure kidney function with, these, with this keratinin test, one from that big muscle builder, we find that people that look like they've got the best kidney function have actually got a higher risk of death than people who are sort of in the middle. We wouldn't detect them if we rely on keratinin. What about this best guess, this estimated GFR, what we're measuring all the time from keratinin? Again, slightly higher risk of death when they're better. There is this chemical called cystatin C. It's made by all the cells in the body, and the kidney gets rid of it. Luckily, kidney is the only thing that gets rid of it. So depending how high or how low it is in our bloodstream, that is actually quite an accurate marker of kidney function. Now, if we look at kidney function according to what cystatin C says, we find that the people with the best kidney function according to cystatin C have the lowest risk of death, and the people with the worst according to cystatin C have the highest risk of death. So this chemical that we could measure with a simple lab test seems much more closely associated with risk. And creatinine, which we measure in pretty much the same way, seems pretty bad. And the thing that worries me is I, as a doctor, might be thinking someone's low risk when they're not. And I don't want to do that. I want to make the right risk decision based on the right blood test. And I need research to help me do that. This, again, is looking at risk for heart attacks and for cardiovascular events that lead to death. And it's the same thing looking at best to worst kidney function. And if we use cystatin C, we find that we can very accurately tell what those risks are. If we use our kidney function that our labs give us at the moment, using that, we find that we can't really tell who's at risk. Whereas this one, we can tell, it's, it's, it's a runaway winner, isn't it? We can tell who is at risk with this, with this blood test of follow-up of heart attacks, but we can't if we use the current test. They're measuring the same thing, but the satin C does it an awful lot more accurately and does it in a way that helps us pick up who is at risk, who do you need to advise, who do you need to change medication on. So, the right blood test for kidney function. So, Another summary slide. We could predict which patients with CKD are at risk of cardiovascular disease with a different blood test than the one we use at the moment. We may be able to estimate kidney function from this test as well. So in, in sort of medical jargon, that gives us two things. Diagnosis, do you have CKD or not? And prognosis, what's going to happen next? Am I at risk? Do we need to change medication? Do we need to do things more intensively? One blood test could give us two really important things in kidney disease. 
What else might be associated with CKD? What else? I've bunched a number of studies together um, to try and show a message a bit more simply here. What I'm doing is I'm going to show the risk uh, of patients, um, the risk of certain conditions depending on how well your kidneys are doing. These are patients who don't have CKD. These are patients who have a mild form of, of chronic kidney disease, an early reduction in the, in the filtration. And these where the kidney disease is a bit more advanced. There's less filtration going on. Now, atrial fibrillation is actually quite a common condition. And it's where our heart beats irregularly. So normally if we feel our pulses, most of us feel a fairly regular steady pulse. It's quicker when we're excited, slows down when we're asleep. That's basically it. With atrial fibrillation, we lose that regularity. That in itself isn't necessarily a problem. But sometimes the heartbeat can go a lot quicker when it's irregular, and we can slow that down. The main problem with atrial fibrillation, though, is that because the heart is beating irregularly, the blood flow is a bit more turbulent than normal. And if the blood flows in a more turbulent way, is at risk of clotting. And so a clot could be sitting in your heart and then travel up our neck blood vessels and land in the head and cause a stroke. Luckily, we have some very good medications to prevent that, warfarin, for example, and some newer medications that don't require as much or any monitoring, in fact, like warfarin. But what this shows us is compared to people with CKD, without CKD rather, as our kidneys get a bit worse in terms of their filtration, the risk of having AF increases. And we've, we've adjusted for all the things that might be doing that, like age on the bits and pieces. In other words, just the fact that your kidneys are filtering a bit less increases the risk of atrial fibrillation. And that's important. What else? Well, if you were to do some brain scans of a lot of people with kidney disease, uh, who hadn't had any strokes, they hadn't had any events where they had loss of uh, speech or loss of power, or loss of sensation or change in vision, you find that actually this thing called what we call a silent brain infarct. In other words, you look at a very, very sensitive scan of the brain and find there are small, tiny strokes, but you haven't felt any different. So we call them silent. They're silent strokes. And those increase with chronic kidney disease, not due to age or anything else just the fact that the kidneys aren't working quite so well. And they're a problem because a silent brain infarct, that's a risk for having a stroke that you do notice because the speech is lost or weakness or sensory problems. So that's important for us too. Another big thing that chronic kidney disease can cause is a reduction in our cognition, cognitive impairment, moving on to dementia as well. And as our population ages and becomes more complex. So the kind of patients I see when I do home visits in the out of hours are uh, patients where there's um, disturbance of cognition, um, falling, um, complexity, fragility. And cognitive impairment is one of our major challenges in the health system. To detect it, to be able to support people because we are all living much longer than before and and our cognitive, or rather our, our cognitive strategies are challenged as we get older because we have less what's called <coughs> cognitive reserve. Our brains just can't quite work as well as previously. And chronic kidney disease may be driving that too. So again, it's another reason why kidney disease is important. So CKD increases the risk of other conditions. And the things, those other conditions are often the challenges that we're all going to face in older age. Now, the last few slides, I want to talk about the challenge for different communities that CKD poses. What do I mean by that? Well, I've looked at the amount of kidney disease in every primary care trust in the England. And what you find is that it could be as little as 1% of your adult population have CKD, to as high as 10% of your adult population with CKD. So across the country, there's marked differences in the amount of adults who have CKD. Why is that? You'll be able to work it out if I tell you this. So the lowest areas, where well, there's the least amount of CKD, Westminster, followed on the heels by Hammersmith and Fulham, and the areas that have the highest, Blackpool, 
North Lancashire, Newcastle upon Tyne, Barnsley. This isn't geography, this is deprivation. CKD is actually a disease of deprivation. Okay. One of the important things with social inequalities uh, is chronic kidney disease. So deprivation is associated with chronic kidney disease, partly explained by smoking and obesity, both of which increase the amount of kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. Now, in primary care research, we we're obviously very, um, very um, keen to try and work out what the link is between deprivation and health, and to try and work out what are the things that are that the link between being having uh, having poor financial status or social status and poor health. But whenever we try and do that, we can never fully explain it. All the studies that we've done to try and work this out, there's always something left that we can't explain that deprivation is doing that we can't quite work out. And it's the same in kidney disease. Smoking and obesity partly explain it, but there's something else that we're not measuring and we thought we were measuring everything. So the burden of chronic kidney disease is in fact greatest in deprived communities who also will therefore have a greater burden of heart attack, stroke, heart failure, and cognitive impairment. So hopefully I've persuaded you that chronic kidney disease is more important than ever. The decline in kidney function increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Getting the right risk marker is going to help us identify which patients are at risk, though. The complex problems in older age are actually also associated with CKD, and we need research that we're planning to do within the population prevention theme in the Biomedical Research Centre that will help us define who is at risk of cardiovascular disease, which interventions will reduce risk most effectively, and how we can deliver them in all communities. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening.